redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb. O come, let us bow down and let us worship Him. Receive now God's blessing. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord, through the, through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue our worship in song number 185, O Come and to Jehovah Sing. In our discussion of worship, in our Sunday morning discussions, we're going to be talking about the elements of worship. And certainly, song and the exuberance of song is an element of worship. It's a part of our expression of praise to God. O Come and to Jehovah Sing. Let's sing the first three stanzas and the last, omitting the fourth of 185. Certainly a distinct and important element of worship is our public confession of faith as we publicly recite what we believe of God, what we believe of His Word. We're glad to do that before His face and with God's church of all ages and every nation, tribe, and tongue. And now here in this sacred assembly, gathered together in Jesus' name, let's all say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue in song number 217 to the tune of 221. Oh, praise the Lord, for he is good. 217.
It is wonderful to be in the house of the Lord again on this Lord's Day to conclude the public aspect of our, of our day and of our worship in the assembly of the saints huddled together as we are in blustery Michigan winter, uh, Canadian winter, whatever. It's uh, exceeding brisk for some of us. But it's amazing how the, the Lord brings us together and through all of the elements he gives us to focus on what is the most important, regardless of weather, and regardless of the difficulty of getting to church sometimes. Some we're aware are, are not able to come to be with us, and we pray for them. We should pray for them tonight, that they can have a Lord's Day blessing. Perhaps some are listening on the internet, even as we speak, they're hearing our concern for them. That they may be blessed as well. And those who may be visiting, we welcome you. We give you a hearty welcome, and we pray that you would, in the name of Jesus, know his blessing and know the faithfulness of God to you and your family and to all of us as we gather as one family in Jesus Christ, our elder brother, Savior, and Lord. Let's pray now in his name. Heavenly God and Father, we thank you so much that you bring us together to, to worship because, Lord, Really, there's no other place we'd rather be than in the worship of the saints in the sacred assemblies that you call in these days and in these latter days, too. We neglect not these assemblings together, Lord. They are sacred and important means of grace for us and our children. And also, Father, there's a positive reason we come. We want to, to praise you as you have ordained and as is the leading of your spirit and truth so that we might, Lord, worship you in spirit and in truth, and so that even we can be born up to heaven in some way, the way of faith and the way of your grace, the way of hope, so that we can be encouraged in our life. For we confess to you right now, Lord, that we've confessed our faith, that we've looked to the part of believing Christians, yet our faith is weak. And we are buffeted about on every side with all kinds of temptations and trials. In the stormy blast of the cold and of the wind and of the snow is just a picture of what it's like in our soul and what it's like spiritually in the, the demons of the air. They would have their way with us. They're more powerful than we are. But Father in heaven, we pray now in the sacred assembly that you would strengthen us. We need that, Lord. We need the Lord God Almighty's strength to carry on. We're, we're very, very weak. And so weak sometimes that we are taken to sin and we fall, we stumble. And whether it's body or soul sin, it's terrible, Lord. We hate that sin that we so readily commit. We hate snapping at one another and biting and devouring those for whom Jesus died. We hate the hopelessness that we so easily show, not only about our cups being half full, but about our lack of hope in you, a lack of hope that should breed contentment not only, but an exhilaration in living. We so readily do not show that, Lord. We are so sorry, too. But, Lord, we pray that you would touch our hearts, go from soul to soul, ear to ear, and into the hearts of your people here, that we can truly say and know this is good for us to be here. You are whispering to us and sharing with us the secrets of your covenant, the secret of your own life, of your own triune fellowshipping life. You would part have us partake in some earthly measure of this wonderful fellowship, so that we as your children can be taken into the embrace of the divine family and know that all is well. This is what we hope for, Lord, and this is what we believe. And now as we pray, we thank you. You are hearing. You are strengthening the weak knees. You are reminding us of truth where we had been deceived a little while ago and we were walking by sight and not faith. You are enlightening us. You are the one who is comforting us and encouraging us and admonishing us by your Spirit. For we're coming, Father, praying 
that we may be heard of you only for your glory and praise, your hallowing, and then for our blessing in Jesus Christ, whom we love and adore. We pray, Father, that you would keep everyone and keep us in this world apart from the world, that is, so that we can show off the distinctiveness of being Christian, of being followers of the one who is the Son of Man and the Son of God, and whose salvation is a deliverance from this present evil age into the arms of God, into the fellowship of the Most High, and into this foretaste of heaven itself, into the kingdom of heaven. We ask, Lord, that your blessing would rest upon this church, its sovereign grace. May we be champions of sovereign grace, Lord, not out for ourselves our name, but for the promotion of your reputation and honor. This is why we exist. And we pray that you would truly condescend, Father, to be very near to us. Add, Lord, to us in all the ways that you would do so that we would be blessed and more fortified to be able to praise you from week to week. If that be numbers, Father, we would be so glad, glad to see in our midst, in the physical way, individuals and families being joined to the ranks here in our church. That we can together be a stronghold of truth in this part of the, of the city, in the state, of the country. And at this time, when indeed it is near the end, we ask, Lord, that you would bless us spiritually, bless our persons, bless our hearts, bless us in all our circumstances, bless our families, and bless our elders and deacons and pastor. And we pray, Father, that you would truly show the attitude, the blessedness of being members of Christ, of being justified and sanctified, incorporated into his body, so that we know his life, that we experience and taste and see the goodness of God, and which is mediated through your Son, his death, his resurrection, his present mediation, and his coming again. We pray, Father, that you would give us to pray. We prayed for this this morning. We pray it again. Teach us to pray, Lord. Catechisms and godly men of old have always taught us, because your word teaches us, that prayer is the principal way we show thanks, that we show that we live, that we show that salvation is all about a relationship with you, where we talk to you and with you, and we hear from you, and we ourselves are empowered and enabled to carry on. So, Father, teach us to pray. Teach our children and young people to be oft on our knees and always, without ceasing, prayerfully giving our way over to you. We need this as fathers and mothers and heads of the home that way. We can be prayerful of nothing else that our children would know of mom and dad they pray. When mom and dad are in another room or when they are individually in different places of devotion, that we would know they pray. They are leading the way to heaven in their home. And so, Father, we pray to slow down when it needs slowing down our lives, to take time to be holy, to be still and know that you are God. And so, Lord, we'll be different indeed. And this will bring persecution. This will be that others will look at us awkwardly and, and mock us not only, but will increasingly press us out of this world and not allow us to partake of the benefits that it sees are the only benefits of life and of death, gaining the world. Lord in heaven, may we count it a privilege to be persecuted for Christ's sake, a privilege to bear our cross, that others may know the worth of the Savior and of the gospel. We pray, Father, that you would bless in this last days with conversion your own from every nation, tribe, and tongue and cause the kingdom to come. And Lord, when it's established, be there. Be there in the midst. Strengthen your people. Strengthen them to be this strong city on a hill and not to come down where there's been apostasy and a falling and a tumbling down the cliff and down the hill into the world, we pray that there may be renewal, that there may be revival, that there may be the recommitment to truth and the faith of our fathers. Lord, we need this. 
Our children need this, and all of us need to ask for the old paths wherein is the good way, and not to seek after this new thing or the next, which the philosophers of the world would tempt us to seek. Hear our prayers, Lord, and bless us that there may be fervency about us, heat and light together, this wonderful godly combination, this spiritual attitude and activity and power. May it be that we put away sin and increasingly are godly, even like your Son, conformed to his image, showing the whole world that there is a God who justifies the ungodly, and when he does so, he sets them free from the power and dominion of sin and takes them into the realm of the holy God himself, fellowship with him. Lord, we pray, bless in every aspect of our living, so that living and dying, we know the only comfort in life and death, that is, belonging to Jesus Christ, his property, now and forevermore, body and soul, world without end. In his name we pray in the pardon of our many and grievous sins. Amen. Your offering at this time for the general fund of this church will, will now be received. Let's sing now, number 84 in the Psalter hymnal. God is our refuge and our strength, something we need to know in these end times. The anti-Christian power is rearing its ugly head. God is our refuge and our strength, our ever-present aid. And therefore, though the earth remove, we will not be afraid. Let's sing all the stanzas, 84.
Let's take our Bibles at this time and turn to the book of Revelation in chapter 16. Revelation 16. I'm going to read all of the verses. The last section is the section we'll be treating, but I want us to consider the context here. The pouring out of the vials by the seven angels who pour out vials or bowls of the wrath of God onto the earth. Revelation 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. And the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just to do. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. And what follows is my text, especially we'll be focusing on the sixth angel and his bowl and that aspect of his wrath, the wrath of God, which is called the battle of Armageddon. Verse 10, then the, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon or Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done, or it is finished. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. <clears throat> Thus far we read God's holy word. May the Lord give us wisdom. And wisdom to hear now of Armageddon. Armageddon is the last battle of the ages on this earth, fought on the great day of God Almighty, as we read in the text before us. Many have been the speculations about this battle of Armageddon or Armageddon. The, battle, the battle's date has been speculated upon too often, and so foolishly, even one has written a book about 30 years ago, uh, speaking something like this, that the 1980s would be a count town to Armageddon. And so in the book, there was this prophesying of certain things that would have happened, and the fellow's prophecy didn't come to pass. Obviously, Armageddon did not happen. And then we find him in later years, 1990s, I believe, 
having visions of Cobra attack helicopters and that these were the, the uh, pouring forth of the wrath of God in the beginning of Armageddon. Well, such foolishness may it be far from us as we consider the battle of Armageddon from God's point of view. Truly, I've been praying that God would give me wisdom and give us wisdom to discern the things of this great and terrible battle that it is on the great day of God Almighty. Wisdom. We need wisdom here, something that we need always when reading and discerning God's will in the Bible, something we need also and perhaps especially when discerning God's will and the gospel in Revelation. And we've seen that there's different aspects of wisdom that we just must hold on to if we're to consider things in the uh, book of Revelation wisely and as gospelers, God's people. One of them is that it's all about Jesus and his coming in history. And certainly we have to see that with regard to the battle of Armageddon. We have to see too that Revelation is about God's coming into history in the person of his son to redeem his church, but in the way of battle, in the way of this conflict between the city of man and the city of God, which is almost invariably called Jerusalem or Israel. That's the church in the book of Revelation. So we're to see these things wisely and also to see what is literal, what is symbolic, how to tell the difference as we'll see as we, as we undergo to interpret also this battle of Armageddon. So may God give us wisdom, grace, and humility, so that in the end we see that this battle and the revelation of this Armageddon, this great battle on the great day of God Almighty, is for us, even as Jesus Um, issues this call in the middle of this text here. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So we're warned here as well as encouraged by this third of some seven beatitudes in the book of Revelation. Right in the middle of battle is beatitude for the people of God who trust in him. May we know beatitude, great blessing, as we contemplate this awesome battle, Armageddon, the last battle. First of all, let's consider that this is a war to end all wars. That's literally, it's the last battle on the earth. And secondly, we want to consider that there's wrath here, the wrath of God, it being one of those vials of the wrath of God that's poured out, wrath and revelation of God. Revelation of God we know in Jesus Christ uh, primarily, who's the Word of God. And then finally, we want to be warned here as well, as Jesus does in this cry here in verse 15, but also to be encouraged in the great blessing that he would give to us. So the war to end all wars. Bear with me. I want to unpack for you what I believe I've discovered what's certainly biblical, though I don't have all of the answers about Armageddon, certainly not its place, certainly not uh, the time of the battle, but certain things we need to know to be wise and faithful and God's people on this earth up to the time of the great battle and the coming of our Savior. Well, the first thing we have to remember is that this is a bowl of the wrath of God that's being poured out. The sixth angel, and we're going to focus, by the way, on this sixth bowl. The sixth angel pours out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. The water's dried up. The way of the kings from the east is prepared. And there's unclean spirits that come out and so on. But then part of this is that there's this battle. The kings are gathered together for the battle. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. And I want to remind us that the way to, to um, unpack this, to reflect upon this very wisely, is to consider the pattern that Revelation has of presenting events and then re-presenting events in a different way. From one point of view, first of all, but then comes back to these same events in history and looks at it from another point of view. Kind of like you would do if you're taking pictures of an event, you're taking pictures and then someone else takes pictures of the same event, maybe a wedding, 
and you have people from different angles. You get a different take on things, but it's the same marriage, it's the same wedding, it's the same event, just different angles. So that's how Revelation records history. Revelation is a record of history and the playing out of history, especially from the time of Christ first coming to the time of the end. And it's lots of time, therefore, that's presented. And God wants us to get it. He wants us to understand this very important revelation that he gives of the coming of the Savior. And so he presents it first from this angle, then from that angle, different angles, different shots as of a camera of same events. And in fact, Revelation has three different cycles of judgments, three different ways that it comes back to same events from different points of view. And you can see these in the book of Revelation. They portray the same history, first from this angle, then from that. And they're called the cycles of seals and trumpets and then these vials or bowls of wrath. Each of these cycles are seven. There's seven seals that the Son of Man is given to open. And he opens them as opening up the counsel of God, as it were, and executing judgments on the earth. He's worthy to do that as the agent of God's salvation and also of judgment. And he does this. And there's the happening of things through the opening of the seals. When these are opened, things come to pass, just as God has ordained them under the command of his, his wonderful son, Jesus Christ, the lion and the lamb. So seals. And then in the seventh seal is the sounding, the beginning of the sounding forth of trumpets, heralding the judgments of God. The seals signified the judgments of God. The trumpets herald the judgments of God. And these occur in sevenfold way. Then these, the seventh trumpet heralds the pouring out of the vials and the wrath of God through God's appointed angels. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up and reminding us of this is that these cycles are related. And so that if we're going to understand this sixth vial or bowl here, you could go back to the sixth of the trumpets especially, or the sixth of the seals, and, and maybe find some parallelism there, as well as some sort of difference. They're related to one another. There's seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. The first four of each have to do with events on the earth. The second three generally occur in heaven. The skies, the sun, and, and the, the moon and the stars are affected by these judgments. And you can look at that through the book of Revelation. So there's these, this recapitulation, as the theologians call it, this retelling of history so that we get it. God is condescending here to be very long-suffering and to, to present in this ap apocalyptic way, this wonderful revelation sort of way with these great and, and fantastic symbols, but also with a great and certain literalness about them, so that we are blessed, so that the churches of Asia Minor, not only in the, seventh, in the, in the uh, first century, Revelation 2 and 3, but also us who are represented by those seven churches might in these latter days come away with great blessing. So the last book of the Bible. Not such a cryptic book for us, even though it's hard to understand some of these things and all the details especially. But I believe it's something that's giving to us some foretaste of the wonderful ways of God not only history long, but forever. Something here of God in Christ revealed. And so we come up to the bulls of wrath. And, and we should remind ourselves that there is progression here. When at Revelation 16, there's these bulls finally. There's been seals and trumpets, now there's bulls. There's a kind of progression. And we've seen that there is this this scope and intensity that seems to be progressing as God's revealing in this cyclical way his judgments on the earth. In the seals, there's a quarter of a part of the earth that's affected. In the blowing of the trumpets, we have a third of the part of the earth affected. In, this, in the pouring out of the vials of the wrath of God, there's this fullness about it. There's no fraction that's delineated. The whole world is affected. 
This is, in fact, something that I believe brings us right close to the end. It could be, in fact, that the seven bowls of wrath indicate things that are primarily to take place even at the end, and they haven't fully, indeed, taken place yet. Certainly the battle of Armageddon and the great day of God Almighty is in the future. How distant, we don't know, but it is to come, and for this we must be forewarned. So you have this wrath of God that God himself indicates will be finished, completed when these these bowls or vials are poured out. And so we see with the sixth bowl, we see this battle. And we see this battle, and, and it's called for the place where it's fought, namely Armageddon. And definitely we're led to believe this is in the end of time. It is, after all, according to verse 14, the battle of that great day of God Almighty. It is the battle which results in the seventh bowl being poured out, which is the dissolution of the earth. The hills are not found anymore. The mountains are not found anymore. And the islands flee away. And there's great hailstones of a hundred pound weight, children, that fall upon the wicked in that day. It's the great and terrible day of the wrath of Almighty God. Now, actually, we should remind ourselves, Revelation has brought us to the end of time before. If you just look at Revelation 6, or Revelation 11, Revelation 14, which declares the great harvest and the great vintage where the Son of God is trampling on the wicked at the end of time, You'll see what I mean. The end of time is the goal of Revelation, but it's often brought up as having come to pass in, again, these cyclical ways, sometimes in intervals or interludes between the cycles. Also, the end time is brought out. Is that to whet our appetite? Is that to give us to be more forewarned than we should be? I don't know, but certainly it's for our edification. Well, Armageddon must be interpreted, therefore, as this last battle, we should also note that it should be interpreted in light of Revelation 16, where the name Armageddon is mentioned, but also in light of other texts, which I want to read to you now in Revelation, where I believe the same battle is presented. And I'm going to turn, and you are welcome to turn with me at this time to Revelation 19, first of all. In Revelation 19... And verses 11 and following, we believe what I have, uh, no, we have what I believe is a record also of the last battle. Revelation 19, 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. Now this is obviously Jesus. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called, there you have it, the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and and wrath of Almighty God. Again, linking him with what we're going to find out about in Revelation 16 of Armageddon. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. And you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, And their armies, again, linking us with Revelation 16, the battle of Armageddon. The beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gather together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. That, I believe, is 
another presentation of the battle, so-called Armageddon. Now just flip over to Revelation 20 and verses 7 and 10. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. We have that in our sixth vial. To gather them together to battle whose name is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, there you have it. Read a lot. I think it's great to be immersed in these things, to be thinking about these things biblically. You get one angle, you get another, not only from the cycles of judgments and seals and trumpets and vials, but also from these interludes and these presentations of things from different points of view in different points of way, uh, different, in different ways. Now, I'm going to even, at the risk of overload, remind you, point you to the fact that this ain't all. <laughs> this is not the only way that the Bible describes Armageddon and the last battle. These are not the only passages, I should say. There are also other Old Testament passages which speak of this battle. I'm just going to cite one passage which speaks of Gog and Magog coming against Israel, the people of God in the Old Testament. You can read that on your own, Ezekiel 38 and 39. It reads like the book of Revelation is drawing right from that passage and that prophecy of Ezekiel in order to outline the battle of Armageddon. Now, lots of that preliminary is important for us to discuss the question, what now is Armageddon. Now, some think that this is a place, a geographical, local place, and they cite that this could very well be a hill or mountain or city of Megiddo. Now, Megiddo was on the plains of Estrelon, north of Jerusalem, and indeed was a site historically of battles in Israel's day and also in the history of the nations which battles were not of little moment, some of them. They were significant. Kings of Israel, for example, were slain on the plains of Esterlon in and around Megiddo. We think also of the, the victory that God gave to Deborah and Barak over Sisera and over the Canaanites. This occurred at Megiddo in the plain or the city or the mountain of Megiddo, whatever you want to call it. Now, I want to suggest to you that it, this could be that there is a literal battle in this literal place here, and that's in accord with how I've been interpreting the vials in general. First four vials, I said, though there is some symbolism in them. For example, when the sea is turned to blood, I'm not so sure that's literally blood, but it's certainly a place of death. There is some literalness about it, nevertheless, even though there's some symbols, so that indeed the oceans are polluted and the fresh water is polluted in the pouring out of the second vial and the earth itself becomes a, a place of disease and not of health and habitation and the sun itself in the fourth vial being poured out is scorching people with heat and specifically scorching the wicked who have the mark of the beast. These are bowls of wrath after all. Indeed, as I said last time, I believe that the Bible does teach global warming. It's the wrath of God upon the wicked and the scorching of the sun, if you want to believe or describe that as global scorching. Well, so there's a literal uh, way of looking at this. It's quite in harmony with how you can interpret uh, Revelation. At times it's full of symbols, and there are symbols certainly here. When you have devils and demons coming out of their mouth. They look like frogs. That's symbolic of unclean things and so on. But it could be that there is a literal battle here in Armageddon in a literal place sometime toward the end of time. I'm not going to argue with that, though I'm not going to try and attempt to find it. However, 
want to consider with you that there has to be a spiritual point of view with regard to these literal things so that we can focus on really what's happening here. And I think that we can find this if we investigate that term Armageddon, which is also could be translated Armageddon, if you have a rough breathing mark here for Greek scholars, could be translated Armageddon, which some have said means mount. And then you can take the other part of it, uh, Megiddo or, or, the, or whatever it's, it's called in our text here, Armageddon or Megiddo, as referring not to Megiddo, but to an assembly. And so some have said there's an an Ahar Moed, which in the Hebrew is a mount of assembly. And then people have gone to say that, therefore, it's not the place Megiddo, but it's a people who are called the mount of assembly that are being attacked here at Armageddon, or Armageddon, the mount of assembly, which some say is a reference to Israel itself. In Isaiah 14 and verse 13, they'll say there's an allusion there to the description of Jerusalem as the mount of assembly where God gathers with his people. And here, the nations are called to gather or assemble to the mount of assembly. So, you see, it takes us beyond a place to be a description of a people, and that people is none other than the people of God. And that's the point that many would make, and I would as well. The people that are being attacked here by the kings of the east are those who go by the name the people of God. Now, I want to just point out to you as well that other places in the Bible, for example, the prophet Zechariah, point to the fact that the last battle will be at Jerusalem. Zechariah 14, verse 1 through 3. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. Then you go back to chapter 12 of Zechariah, the same thing. Verse 3, it will happen in that day. I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut to pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. So Armageddon whether it's translated Megiddo, whether it's a literal place, Megiddo, or Mount of Megiddo, or Plain of Estron, whatever, is representative for the people of God who live there or nearby there. Certainly the inhabitants of Jerusalem, which have historically been known to be the people of God. And that reminds us that this battle here, <clears throat> to be wise in our interpretation of it, is nothing else or different than the principal battle of the ages. The battle of God's people, or those who go by the name of God's people, and the wicked. That is what we should see all battles in the Bible to be about. And that certainly is what the Bible is talking about everywhere in Revelation and also here. Wisdom does not see this as some side battle, and with all due respect for the battles that we fought, World War I, World War II, and we thought perhaps we were on the side of right, with all due respect for those who fought and those who, who loved the principles for which we fought. That is not, those are not World War I, World War II, the principal battles of the age. The principal battles of the age are the battles of God and His church and His Christ against the wicked and the kingdom of darkness. And so the Bible is all about, you see, that battle and Christ coming to redeem his church through battle. You see, it goes back even to the cross where Jesus said at one time, the battle of sin is finished. And here you read in this same battle, right in the middle of this, this voice from the temple, I'm running ahead of myself, say, it is finished when he's describing the battle describing the wrath of God that's poured out. Never, never, never forget that principle of interpretation, that principle by which we live. God Almighty is the God of battle and the battle of the church. But now, 
Having said that, and that Jerusalem here stands for the, the people of God, the church, those who go by the name of the people of God, let's remember that at this time, Jerusalem, Israel, everything that looks like the people of God at this point in history and this point in the book of Revelation is fake. It's not real. There's a hint of that. Revelation 11, which also has taken us to the end. How we are scouring the Bible here. Revelation 11 and verse 8. The two witnesses there, toward the end of time, their dead bodies lie in the street of the great city. That's Jerusalem, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. That's Jerusalem at this time. In fact, this Jerusalem is so false, it is nothing different than a spiritual component of the anti-Christian kingdom called Babylon. Later on, we read in Revelation 16 that Babylon is remembered before God in connection with this battle of Armageddon, verse 19, the great city is divided into three parts. The cities of the nation fell, and great Babylon is remembered before God, the anti-Christian kingdom, which had this religious component in the false church. And again, we've seen this over and over and over again. You have here in Revelation 16 as well, these spirits coming from the mouth of the dragon, verse 13, out of the mouth of the beast, the political aspect of the power. In Revelation 13, we've seen that. And out of the mouth of the false prophet come these spirits as well to deceive the nation. It's all pointing to the fact that religiously and politically there is this, this great thing called Antichrist, Babylon. And Armageddon is a battle with regard to that anti-Christian kingdom that looks like a lamb-like kingdom, looks like a lamb does this beast rising out of the earth, but speaks like a dragon or devil does this lamb and deceives the nations with its own goodness and with what it thinks it has to offer. Well... Long discussion on the identity of Armageddon, but I believe it's so very important for us to remember so that we can understand now this battle and how this battle takes place. And I want to point out to you that this battle takes place by a certain um, preparing of the way, as the text says here, the preparing of the way of the kings of the east, and the sixth angel pours out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Well, I want to point out to you, first of all, though, the setting, and that will help us to understand this. You have the Antichrist going to do battle with the kings of the east. That's Armageddon. The Antichristian looks like God's people power is doing battle with these other beings, these other kings in these nations of the east. They come when the Euphrates River dries up. What's going on here? Well, remember what happened in the pouring out of the first bowls, the first four bowls. The whole world was decimated. That is, the place where the Antichrist existed and the things that the Antichrist has to offer to this world. The allurement of the Antichrist, the power of the Antichrist is judged by God. So the seas, so the fresh water, so the sun itself, and so the earth itself, which the Antichrist was offering to people who would worship him, is now become plagued by God. And remember, these are bowls of wrath that are poured out specifically on the Babylonians, the Antichristian people who bore the mark of the beast. They're the ones who get hit with the wrath of God. Now, this may occur uh, in an increased measure at the end of time, gradually throughout this dispensation, as I think it does, but especially at the end of time. But it comes to the point 
where in the pouring out of the fifth bowl, look at that, something happens to the power of the beast. Look, in the fifth bowl, the fifth angel pours out his bowl on the throne of the beast, his command center, his place of authority, and his kingdom became full of darkness. Remind you of the plague upon Egypt, doesn't it? As several of these plagues do. What happens is the inhabitants of the kingdom of the beast gnawed their tongues because of their pain. They blasphemed God. They didn't repent. And because of their pains and sores, they didn't repent at all. But you see what's happening here. There's some weakening of the kingdom of Antichrist. He was almighty. If you look at Revelation 13, we visited that in our sermons here. This kingdom of Antichrist was so mighty, so powerful, that people adored him. They adored the beast who was in, under the control of the devil. They worshipped him. They were a people who even thought he was God. And Paul says in Thessalonians 2, yes, indeed, he claimed to be God. He sits in their temple. He claims to be Christ, therefore, because God in his temple with his people is Christ Jesus, the word of God. He's claiming something to be, he's claiming somehow to be lamb-like, offering peace, offering health care, offering the world, the sky, the automobiles, freedom, equality, offering human things. And so we learn And he who has wisdom has learned that this is the kingdom of man with the number of man, 666, everything about man which cannot satisfy but which seems for a while to satisfy the needs and the desires and the aspirations of people who of all things don't want God and his word but they'll take the world instead. Now the world, as the pouring out of the first four vials indicates, is being taken away from the Antichrist. And there's darkness in his kingdom. There's confusion. There's unrest. There's a weakening. And this, as well as the deception of the Antichrist, by which he himself once deceived even the heathen, even the pagans who worshipped other gods, to come alongside of him, this will lead even so that the pagans... Those are represented by the kings of the east, as we shall see. They come and they take on the anti-Christian stronghold that has now become weakened and darkened and full of upheaval, the anti-Christian kingdom at the very end. Well, I'm alluding to something here in verse 12 that we ought to take note of. The sixth angel pours out his bowl. The great river Euphrates, the waters dried up so the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And they're called Gog and Magog in Revelation 12 and also Ezekiel 38, 39. The kings of the east have always represented those who were outside of the pale of visible, the visible people of God. This is clear from the fact that Euphrates, the great river, was always in the Old Testament the river that divided Israel from the kings of the east, from the pagans. So you have Abraham called out of Ur of the Chaldees, east of the Euphrates, into the other side and to become a people and and the father of the believers in Canaan, first of all. So you have David, whose kingdom, when it was at its extent, had for its eastern border the Euphrates, and to the east of that were the pagans who were the enemies of the people of God, as well as were the Canaanites even within the kingdom of heaven. Be that as it may, it's a symbol as the Euphrates for the dividing line between the pagans and what is called Christendom, or the Western, or what we'd call the Western nations, Europe, the Americas, and so on. That's how this is interpreted by those of us who take this view. It is, indeed, something that happens at the end of time. The Euphrates dries up. And this is, I believe, a way that the Bible describes uh, the, the, uh, the beginning of a destruction of the people of God or even of any other nation. In fact, historically, Cyrus himself diverted the Euphrates and dried it up so that 
Babylon, which was built on or near the Euphrates River, could be marched into up the dry riverbed by Cyrus, who destroyed Babylon and who later let the people of God go back into the uh, land of promise. Be that as it may, here it's this representative of what divides heathendom from Christendom, what looks like Christianity, the anti-Christian power, which is nevertheless, even though it's deceived these nations long, <clears throat> now become weakened. And now the heathen themselves, who never did go after the God of Israel, the true God, are turning on even the wicked anti-Christian kingdom. And so you have the nations of the East, the nations of the West, all the nations gathering about what seems to be the people of God. But they're so confused. They're attacking one another in their wickedness. This is how I interpret this. And right in the middle of this battle, right in the middle of this battle, and this is my interpretation. I cannot be dogmatic about it, but it's certainly biblical, and it fits into all of the revelation we have, for example, in Revelation 19. But right in the middle of this battle, Jesus comes from heaven. And there the nations are battling, the anti-Christian conglomerate, that wicked Babylon, which has fallen and which has been exposed to the wrath of God, and now the wrath of God turning on the anti-Christian kingdom by the very heathen that it had deceived, Jesus comes and he shows who is their real enemy, who is the real King of kings and Lord of lords. I believe if this is anything close to the actual fact here at the end of time, and again, I feel very humble and limited in trying to interpret all of these things. That is the case, though. Anything like it, it's going to be an awesome day because everyone will see that Jesus is king. And that's what I want, don't you? Everyone will see that there's only one God, and there's only one God with whom sinners have to contend, and only one God who saves, and one God whose wrath is poured out upon the nations who rejected him. One God of heaven, one God of hell. I believe even when Jesus appears in this last battle, and the anti-Christian forces, and the pagan forces see this, and they're going to see you're going to see, he rides on a white horse and, and he has these, these, this battalion with him on the white horse, angels, maybe us as well, the, the elect of God. They're going to turn and they're going to say, we need to fight against him. This always has been the object of our hate. This is the one we cannot stand. And I find in here a parallel to when Jesus first came to the earth. Remember that? In the Gospels, you read of this man, Jesus, who was hated. This God with us, Jesus, who was hated so much so that the religious forces, the Jews, they band with one another, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who couldn't stand one another. They joined forces and said, we've got to get rid of them. And they joined forces with the pagans, the Romans. And there they were who had erstwhile battled against themselves. They became friends in this this one must go. This one must be crucified. This one shouts of our sin. He says to us, we are sinners in need of him and of him alone. We can't have that. And that's exactly what the world does. And to Christian, pseudo-Christian world, pagan world, outwardly demonic, all of them deceived by the devil, they turn on the king of kings at the end of time when they finally see in the midst of all the deception of the Antichrist is, is, is gone away that they have to do with the Son of God. And having to do with the Son of God is not a good thing. It's a hopeless thing. Christ defeats the enemy and it never was in doubt that battle. Never, ever, ever. You need to know that, and so do I. Battle at the end, never in doubt. The battle that you're fighting, never in doubt as to the outcome. 
because Jesus Christ is King and He is Lord and He loves us in the midst of the battle and also with regard to this end time battle of the nations against Him. In fact, I believe it's Jesus, can't be dogmatic here, who cries out, who's the loud voice who comes out of the temple of heaven in verse 17, from the throne there, saying, it is done, it is finished. And just as on Calvary he said in one of the words of the cross, it is finished, the atonement is done. Then he says at the end of time, it is finished, the wrath of God upon the wicked. The vials are poured out. The bowls are poured out. It is the day of the judgment of God. And let us note here, Revelation. There is light in Revelation here about the identity of God Almighty. He's really God. He comes and vindicates himself. This is his day. It's not the day either of Antichrist or of the pagan. It's not about men. It's not about their conquest. It's not about Iwo Jima. It's not about the battle of the bulge. It's about this. It's about this Armageddon. It's about this final day when God will be glorified and all of his righteousnesses will be seen to have been right and all of his love which has been spurned will see to have been the only way we could have been saved. And so he gets the glory in Jesus Christ, you see who is the one who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. When this whole world, as a result of this battle, I believe, the seventh angel pours out his bowl into the air, when this whole world is torn apart, and there's noises and thunderings and lightnings, and a great earthquake such as uh, never had occurred since men were on the earth, and the great city is divided into three parts. I believe that might be Jerusalem or, or the Antichristian kingdom, whatever. And then the cities of the nation fell and great Babylon is remembered and she drinks of the cup of the wine of the fierceness of God's wrath. When every island flees away and the mountains are not found anymore and when to top it off there's hail that comes down in hundred pound throws from heaven. When that is seen and every knee will bow And every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And the wicked will be cast into hell. And the righteous will be taken to glory. And the new heavens and the new earth, which had been waiting, waiting to come down from heaven, will come down. And there will be this place, this marvelous place called glory in the new Jerusalem. We will abide there forever. Ever. In the midst of it all, an encouragement and a warning to God's people. I leave you with this. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Jesus is talking. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. In the Bible, the end of time is described as sudden and unexpected. It's described as a time when nobody can calculate so that it can't be in the 1980s or the 1990s according to your calculations or 2014 according to your calculations. It will be according to the wisdom of God. Leave it at that. Leave the location, the center of the battle at that. Leave The form of the battle, whether it's with cobra attack helicopters on the one side or another, certainly it is with the the word of God that the Son of God has as his sword on the other side. But though we don't know just how this battle will occur, but I, I believe, though, it will be a bloodbath, the last bloodbath on the earth in the name of their gods and so on, but against Jesus. Leave it all with God. But know this. Our calling at this time, and I don't believe we're going to be participants at all in the battle, certainly not against the Son of God. Where we're at at this time is is hard to say. When we'll be taken to heaven in the midst of all this is hard hard to say. But, But now, see, now is the calling. Be ready. Be ready. Now, how can we be ready? Just as we said last time, be in the Word of God. Be in the Word of God by hearing hearing God speak and declare to you these things. Hear the declaration from heaven through God's servants because we need faith. 
And faith comes by hearing the word of God through a man that God has sent, even through men like yours truly who stumble over interpreting things in Revelation that are hard to interpret, but who endeavors, and you know this, and you know my heart, to bring you Jesus with every sermon. Just hear that. Hear that, and you'll be wise, children, and you'll be believing. You'll be in the Word of God, which is different, you see, than being in the world. We are in the world, but when you're in the Word in the world, that makes all the difference from just being in the world in the world. There's only one letter separating world from word. It's called L, the letter L. Think of hell when you think of that letter and of just being in the world in the world and not in the Word in the world. If you're just in the world in the world, guess what? You're going to love the world. And John says, don't love the world, neither the things that are in it. Because that's what Antichrist offers, the world. And Jesus says, what does it profit your soul if you gain the world and you lose your soul? Don't gain the world nor seek to gain the world. As you're in the word, you'll be taught that. And you'll be taught and you'll be equipped to fight the battle of faith now. There are no Armageddons except maybe foretastes of these things, but there is the battle of faith that we fight. And Jesus is saying, now you be holy in this battle. You who are the justified ones, you heard that this morning, you're sanctified too. Be holy. Demonstrate that you're justified. Demonstrate that you are right with God by his decree, by being in your life God's people. And don't be ashamed at the latter day by shacking up with Babylon, shacking up with a great harlot. Be pure, as Jesus is speaking here and warning here, as those who keep your pants on, those who keep dressed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, those who are careful about everything. Let's we dance the dance of death with the world and don't dance the holy dance with the communion of the saints and in the arms and embrace of God. People of God, let's be warned, but encouragement is to be ours too because, Jesus says, I'm coming as a thief, but blessed are those who watch and who keep themselves. Blessed. The blessedness of being right with God forever. That's ours. So don't fear Armageddon. Don't fear the battle of faith that we must fight right now. Just know whose side you're on. And by the grace of God, be on the right side, contending earnestly for the faith once delivered to all the saints. And God be with you. And be faithful. Let no man and no devil take your crown. Amen. Our Lord in heaven, we pray that on our earth you will bless us. We stammer a few things, a lot of things, about the last battle, which at times can seem so distant and at other times can seem to be approaching. We pray, Father, to behold in these things the gospel, how we need the good news that Jesus Christ is on the throne, that he will defeat all the nations that so foolishly and vainly rage against him. He will defeat the devil. He will defeat the beast and the false prophet and all of their lies will be seen to be the lies that they are. He is the truth, and he is the faithful one whom we love. And we thank you, Lord, for the revelation of that one, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let's turn in our Psalter hymnals and sing number 318, Holy, Holy, Holy. <clears throat> Let's sing stanzas one and four, the first and the last of 318.
After the benediction, we'll sing stanza three, the third stanza of 469. Receive God's benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to this broadcast of Sovereign Grace United Reformed Church. Sovereign Grace Church, served by the ministry of Reverend Mitchell Dick, worships each Lord's Day at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. at the chapel of Kuiper College, located at 3333 East Belt Line Northeast, between Three Mile and Four Mile Roads. You are most cordially welcome to join us for worship or visit us online at www.sgurc.org or contact us by phone at 616-406-8562. It is our prayer that the Lord would add his indispensable blessing to this ministry in order that his name would be glorified through the edification of his people and the translation of sinners out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear Son.